I'm opening first session uh, about locomotion and uh, artificial in intelligence research uh, at the Bio Biomechatronics Laboratory of Özeyn University. Uh, our speakers uh, are uh, Assistant Professor Barkan Urlu uh, and the other uh, speaker Sara Hamdan and the other uh, speaker uh, Ahmet Soliman. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Barkan Urlu. Thank you very much for the introduction. So if you want, maybe I can just share my screen and start presenting. Okay. Okay. Uh, we, can see, we can see your presentation. Okay, uh, so I will just introduce myself very briefly in Turkish, then I will switch back to English. Uh, herkese merhaba, uh, ben Özgün Üniversitesi'nde uh, makine mühendisliği bölümünde çalışıyorum, uh, yardımcı üçent olarak. Biyomekatronik laboratuvarının kurucusuyum. Uh, bugün özellikle Ayşegül Hocam'dan benim daha geçmişte yaptığım bir işle ilgili bir sunum talebi geldi, onu kısaca sunacağım. Onun öncesinde de kısaca şu an neyle uğraştığından bahsedeceğim. Daha sonra doktor öğrencilerim de bizim laboratuvarda yaptığımız uh, son çalışmalardan size bahsedecekler. So hello everyone, my name is Barkan and I'm the head of biomechatronics laboratory of Özi University, Turkey. So this is the outline of my talk. Basically, I would like to just, uh, you know, give you guys a self-introduction and a brief information on my past and current works. Then uh, the main topic uh, in my presentation today is the how we make uh, this robot. It's a, you know, passively compliant robot to walk, you know, and we made it uh, walk efficiently using reinforcement learning and there are some, you know, subtitles within this talk, like the ZMP-based locomotion problem, passive compliance, and also I would like to introduce the uh, policy parameterization method my colleague in, uh, came up with, and then I'll show you experiments. So basically, I received my PhD in Japan, Yokohama National University, and this is a humanoid robot I was working on, and I was actually working on the uh, locomotion control and multi-body dynamics. So I'm not an AI researcher, actually. I'm a multi-body dynamics and system control theory researcher. And um, then I went to Italy to work on this compliant robot, uh, different from the classical robots, basically. It has passive compliance, meaning that it has some springs embedded in each joint, which allow for control and also introduces passive compliance, similar to that of human leg. And I also, but then afterwards, I went back to Japan and worked in Toyota Technological Institute, some uh, one leg jumping robots so, or full body exoskeleton system. So my research expertise a little bit changed from walking robots to exoskeletons, especially human robot interaction. And I also worked on this quadruped robot HiQ in Italy because I'm still affiliated with Italian Institute of Technology. So this was one of the projects I worked on. I also worked on the locomotion control. So if you search, I'm not going to show any videos, but if you search HYQ, HYQ, in YouTube, you can see the videos from this robot. Basically, it's a similar to Big Dog. And I also worked on exoskeletons. So this is one of the recent exoskeletons I worked in Japan. And whenever I was a research scientist in computational neuroscience laboratories in Kyoto, Japan. And this was an exoskeleton. Actually, I will show a video from this one. This is a self-balancing exoskeleton. And basically, right now, I, I got back to uh, Turkey in 2015. And then uh, I started working as an uh, yes, assistant professor there. And maybe I should add that actually my father graduated from Fırat University. Benim babam aslında Elazığ'dan mezun. Adı Elazığ Devlet Mimarlık Akademisi. Yani 78 mezun. 
Therefore, well, uh, so I've been designing and developing controllers for various robotic systems. So, um, and right now I uh, founded the Biomanufacturing Laboratory. We have four PhDs, two of which will give you a presentation and 12 master students, international and diverse. And I have received some grants from the European Union, like Maurice Skodlovska Curie Career Integration Grant, which was completed and running an Erasmus Plus project. So we have uh, some Tubitac project and uh, 1001 and 1003 uh, high budget projects. And also I'm working with presidency of defense industries right now. So briefly speaking, actually my DNA, let's say, is from locomotion research. So in general, I was working on this quad, uh, bipedal robot in Japan in, in 2006 and 2010. So th at that time, actually, the staff stabilization of human and robots was, you know, they were not completely solved. So my PhD thesis was actually focusing on the locomotion control. So if you are interested in these, are the publication list from my PhD. So, I, so my PhD thesis was published in Transactions. If you are interested, just drop me an email or just uh, refer to these papers. Basically, I was using angular momentum uh, by means of a balance criterion. So I would like to skip this part. And because, and then uh, my one of my recent works is actually the exoskeleton research. I'm more interested in exoskeleton more than the humanoid robots, right? Recently, there are of course several reasons. But then one one of the things is that you know can we build a cell balancing exoskeleton while it containing its weight? Because most exoskeletons then crashes and then they cannot really self balance themselves so much. But today I think uh, we have a guest speaker, right, Jesse Grizzly. So he and his colleagues developed one of the, the first self-balancing exoskeletons and we are looking forward to that, his talk. And also, can this exoskeleton endure disturbances and perturbations? Can we guarantee stability while ensuring physical compliance? And what's all to do with the variable physical stiffness? So my one of my approach was actually just to, you know, uh, this work was also actually quite detailed, but I would like to just uh, mention very briefly, so it was also published in Transactions. So this was basically, we were using the passive compliance. And let me open this video. And so here, maybe I can introduce this exoskeleton robot. Of course, because of the ethical reasons in the video, there is no human inside, but I have a passive uh, mannequin, which has some kind of, uh, you know, passive joints, but the robot is actuated by artificial muscles. And it, has, it receives no support. Here you can see some kind of cables, but these are actually so these are like some high uh, pneumatic cables. And thanks to this physical, this uh, control algorithm we, you know, invented, then it ensures its stability and also it can enter all the perturbations here, even the very exaggerated uh, perturbation. Like this one, for example. So if we can hit it, it can still keep its balance in the sagittal plane. So this is basically a variable system. I wore this system many times. It's really powerful. And another thing is it's physically compliant, which is really safe and dependable for human robot interaction. Of course, normally we don't expect exoskeletons to receive such perturbations, but this is just for research purposes. So currently I also build a similar system in my laboratory in Istanbul. So we are still also working towards that uh, goal. But again, today I just briefly mentioned, if you want details, so please refer to papers or drop me just an email. And today, uh, I think because Aisha Gulojam just asked me to explain this uh, RL work, which was uh, actually a collaboration between me and one of my colleagues. Uh, but we, and at that time, we were working for Italian Institute of Technology in Genova. This robot, uh, by the way, of course, in IIT, I also worked in HiQ, which was published in Journal Autonomous Robots. So if you're also interested in quadruped robots, please check that. But today, I would like to talk about the uh, learning to walk efficiently. You know uh, how to do it using reinforcement learning, and I sometimes read papers where you know authors may you know claim to work efficiently, but to me you know and sometimes they try to do it with robots with rigid joints, which means that you know just gears and motors, which is not quite possible to me because you know if you don't store energy, so how can you make it more efficient than the uh, you know baseline walking? That is something I don't really fully understand in this paper. So this robot was specifically built for this purpose. So in order to, of course, measure torque and also to make it work efficiently, there are some springs embedded. So 
But before that, let me just introduce the parametrization method and the learning algorithm method. Actually, the, in this collaboration work, I did the locomotion part and the, also a little bit the robot hardware part. And my uh, colleague, Petar Kormushev, he came up with this algorithm. So if you have any questions, they can, you know, maybe I can take some notes and extend them or you can email him. So he knows, of course, better because he is the developer of this algorithm. But let me try to explain. So what we try to do is, is evolving policy parameterization. We, you know, we can give trajectories to robot and these trajectories can be represented by using splines. And this, uh, you know, and if we use, let's say, cubic splines, the reason why we use cubic splines is to guarantee velocity and position. And you need to define some number of nodes. And then depending on this number of nodes, basically, you know, imagine each node can move up and down. And so that you can, um, you know, uh, change the shape of the spline. And if you introduce more and more nodes, basically, the, then, you know, you can have better resolution. You can have all kinds of strange, uh, you know, trajectories. Well, of course, which is the most optimal one, of course, it's hard to tell, but that's where the reinforcement learning kicks in. So if you have less number of nodes, basically you have very bad resolution, but at the same time, then you don't really suffer from high dimensionality. If you increase the number of nodes, you can have better resolution, so you can maybe fit uh, any kind of uh, you know optimal trajectory, but then you suffer from high dimensionality and sometimes overfitting. So idea here was to not the inventing a new RL algorithm. I think we used power uh, reinforcement learning algorithm, but um, uh, the parameterization was the I think the idea came out that came out from uh, my colleague Petar. So basically then if you have this number of nodes then you know, normally the idea is maybe imagine this black was the optimal algorithm that reinforcement learning algorithm tries to converge. And then of course this number of nodes, you can change it. And then of course this, there's some upper and mean and maximum boundaries. And then by moving these nodes up and down, you can try to fit in this uh, trajectory. But again, the more nodes you have, then you have higher resolution. So in, I think he, what he did was uh, to check this algorithm, he just tried a, a simple function approximation. And our idea was that, so of course, we shouldn't really start from high uh, number of nodes because then initially we have, the, we suffer from um, you know, high dimensional problems. So we start from the really small number of nodes and, and it evolves during the process. So you increase it during the process. And that way, basically, for example, initially, of course, reinforcement learning algorithm produces lots of random inputs, which, are, which doesn't make sense. But then, of course, it's like a training process. And if you handle these processes with the next number of nodes, basically, then it, has, it introduces some efficiency. For example, here we have this uh, tilde tau sum function, which was represented by the black uh, C line. And then uh, I think he just used this evolving policy parameterization with our reinforcement learning algorithm. And this is my reward, our reward function, which we try to minimize the error. And then here we have this average return. It says average return. I think he immediately start from 30 nodes, but here we used evolving policy, policy parameterization. Initially we start with four nodes and then uh, increase the number of nodes during the process. So as you can see, the function approximation is much more successful after 200 rolls. Here you can see the blue one, the average, uh, sorry. Uh, so this was, the, so, sorry, this was the policy output and this was the average return. So every return is higher in the case of uh, evolving parameterization. And here you can see the standard deviation, the variance is much less, I think, when using evolving policy parameterization. So here we directly started from like a really high resolution, even from the start. And as you see, the convergence takes much more time and the variance is much more. And in the second simulation experiment, I think he devised the, another simulation where the, you know, we try to avoid the obstacles. So these blue lines are some obstacles. And the idea was, you know, starting from this trajectory and reaching this point. And here again, I think he started with 20 nodes directly. And here he started from four nodes and he increased it during the process, training process. And here you can see the policy outputs. And I think the, when the using evolving policy parameterization, it is way better than high resolution, direct high resolution number of nodes. And here you can see the, you know, average return again. 
variance is much less. You can see the standard deviation here, and for the this is the fixed parameterization. So of course these are some simple, uh, you know, uh, simulation studies. Of course they uh, they show some promising results, but how can we implement it to ZMP based locomotion? So this actually maybe I can just briefly explain the underlying story about this study because my friend Petar he thought that he can make the robot walk using reinforcement learning, and I say you know as a classical mechanical engineer, I say I don't you know I don't think it's quite possible because. When you train a robotic system, basically, of course, it initially fails by learning because learning algorithm gives some kind of, uh, uh, you know, random inputs. And if it's a maybe if it's a robot arm, you can always uh, stop push the emergency button, and these robotic arms they can just bring themselves to home position, and you can run the experiment several times. It is easy, but for the humanoid robot, if you give them random input to joints, and then the robot falls down immediately, and there is no, let's say, enough time to collect information to train it so to me that is uh, you know quite difficult and then but at the same time you know classical the tampi based locomotion is not energy efficient and, uh, because of the reasons i explained now and then we found this you know kind of gray approach so for example if i do something my approach is basically all time mathematical model based so let's call it white box and his approach was like the learning based basically he just makes the system learn all the time end to end it's a black box so we came together and it became a gray box approach so what it does is that so i told him you know what i don't really need the robot to, you know i don't need an algorithm to make the robot walk i can make it walk using some pendulum maybe simply but you can make it energy efficient using reinforcement learning so how is that so in zmp based locomotion basically zmp means zero moment point so it's a balance criterion and these are the equations, so you don't really need to understand the equations, but these are some second order differential equations. They are simple equations. So this Px and Py are some ZMP inputs, and this ZMP, if it's within the support polygon, the robot is able to walk. So if I give some kind of feasible ZMP input, and if I solve this second order differential equation, I can come up with the center of mass trajectory, which is uh, dynamically, which pro you know, which should produce dynamically balanced walking. But at the same time, the problem here is, as you see, the center of mass height is always considered as constant. The reason why is that center of mass has three points, x, y, z, so z being the height. But I have two equations. So I have three unknowns, two equations. So in that case, this is a sort of an underactuation problem. And what we generally do in 90s and 2000s, basically, we just give constant center of mass height. So because we don't know. But the H doesn't, the central mass height doesn't have to be constant. It can be generated via reinforcement learning algorithm, especially this, uh, you know, cubic spline method where we have the evolving policy parameterization. And also the human body, you know, the human body also does, it, it doesn't keep the central mass height constant. Basically, we store energy, so central mass goes down a little bit, so our muscles act like springs. We store energy, then we release it. So this management of this elastic potential energy uh, results in very efficient walking in human. So we thought we can do the same thing because we have this opportunity to have this uh, passively compliant humanoid robot. And then of course, what kind of, so it is not constant, but what kind of trajectory we should get? We had no idea, but we said, okay, we shouldn't have any idea. The robot is able to walk, but then it can, you know, walk, walk, or walk. And then eventually the reinforcement learning algorithm should come up with a optimal trajectory that minimizes the energy. So this idea is also based on this biomechanics work, minimizing central mass vertical movement, increases metabolic cost in walking. So let me introduce the humanoid robot. Actually, this is the prototype. If you see, this is called Oman and compliant humanoid. And right now you cannot see this robot because this was the front of the first prototypes back in 2011. Now it became a full body humanoid robot. But of course, while we were working on it, so they were still working on the upper body, but we just made our experiments using this bipedal uh, the lower body part and again as i told you and there's there are some springs so these springs are usually used for torque control so we can directly control torque because we can measure the motor angle and also the spring deflection using the spring deflection encoder here and if you know the deflection basically then you can measure the torque which allows very safe and dependable control another thing is also these springs they can um, you know uh, store energy and therefore, just like human body, basically. So unlike the human 
sorry, the rigid uh, humanoids that we so often right now, these are, these can somehow mimic the human leg motion. Of course, not entirely, but somewhat uh, comparatively compared to this, uh, their rigid counterparts, they are more human like. So, of course, they complicate the dynamics. Normally, if you study robotics, of course, then you study the dynamics of the robots, but then usually you don't really need springs. But if you have the springs, then the dynamics of classical robots are different. So you should consider the spring elasticity. And I'm going to skip those details, uh, but if you're interested in how, uh, how we configure the springs, you can refer to these papers, especially this transaction industrial electronics paper, we show the resonance frequency. For example, here in this uh, graph, what we see is we excite the robot with different frequencies. And as you see, then at the resonance frequency, we have the maximum deflection in the neon angles, like as are about 11 degrees or 10 degrees. And then it fades out until the second resonance frequency. So this was one of the experiments to define the base frequency. So base frequencies, you know, what we did was actually the frequency sweep. So starting from a very slow, small frequency, like 0 0.25 hertz, the robot is excited vertically. And then eventually at some frequency, the deflections are maximum. So this is the base frequency. Then you have the second and third and frequencies, of course. These are like harmonics of the system. So if you need details, just refer to this paper, though. So then, okay, we have this compliant humanoid. Then, okay, we have this attempt based locomotion. So the robot can walk, but how to make it uh, walk efficiently using RL? We came up with this simple idea. So, the reinforcement learning algorithm, of course, using the past rollouts data and evolving police parameterization method, it actually comes up with the central mass trajectory, the third trajectory, which is not constant anymore. And this is passed as a attempt based trajectory generator. And of course, we need to give some attempt input, swing leg motion. And then, we, as once we know all the swing leg uh, trajectories, central mass, and also threshold, we can use, come up with the joint trajectories. I think this uh, plot was prepared by Petar, so I'm sorry. This is not some simple PID joint position controller because uh, if you just try to control the P control using PID for a passively compliant robot, it is it may be unstable. So there is actually a different uh, cascaded controller with a disturbance of the robot. So don't worry. And I mean that's I mean the whole idea today I would like to present is here actually. But anyways, the whole idea is in, in addition to X and Y. A central mass trajectory, which can be found by ZMP, and they actually ensure stability, or not stability, the dynamic balance. We have the third trajectory coming from the reinforcement learning algorithm. And the walk is executed. So another problem sometimes I see in the papers where people try to minimize energy, they focus on mechanical energy. But if you want to really do some energy minimization, you should consider the electrical energy. Why? Imagine if the robot is just standing, so if they, so first of all, if you would like to use the mechanical ener energy using mechanics, basically then you need to multiply angular velocity with uh, torque. But if the robot is standing, it still consumes energy, but the velocity is zero, so energy is zero, but it doesn't make sense, right? So that's why we use direct electrical energy. We just multiply the current using current sensor and we know the voltages. And then we got the energy. So our reward function was trying to minimize the total electrical energy. So this was the result. Uh, let me just check the time very quick. Oh uh, yeah, I, I spent so much time, sorry. So this, let me just show you the, the video directly. So this was, uh, of course, uh, not really fast walking because it was a, still a prototype. So here you can see the fixed central mass height walking at the left-hand side and the right-hand side is the variable central mass height. So visually, it is hard to understand, but maybe if I can show you the data, then we see that there is an 18% uh, energy decrease. So currently, of course, uh, this robot is fueled and they are still using it, but they have the full body right now, but back then it was a prototype under development still, but yeah, I mean, it was okay to just to do the experiment because it's able to walk. Obviously. So here you can see the lateral view and you, if you just check basically the knee joint, you know, they store the energy and also the ankle. It's hard to tell maybe visually, but. Let's just take a look at the knee.
initially the feet slip a little bit, I think, but still maintain its balance. And they, we also put some LEDs and variable central mass light. You can see the variation is more actually in the less, le, using the LED rates. So to me, the whole, uh, yes, exactly. So please, the RL part is done by Petar Komchev. So here, as you see, the energy consumption, initially, of course, it is, there are some variation because the reinforcement learning algorithm tries to learn. And then eventually it minimizes and then converges to 18% decrease. And here you can see all kinds of uh, algorithms produced by the reinforcement learning algorithm. But eventually, you know, it is around this red, which was the optimal case. And if you are interested, this was first published in IROS 2011. Then with some additional experiments, uh, we published in autonomous robots. So this is more detailed, the last journal paper, has more in-depth information about this work. But then uh, you can say that, you know what, 18%, is it much or is it less? So basically for the given robot, it is the maximum energy efficiency we can reach. Well, how we can know? Because we know the maximum deflections. So the maximum deflection, angular deflection, like because the, when the springs are, you know, compressed to their maximum, then that's where we can have the maximum energy efficiency, right? So, and we know that the deflection can be 11 degrees and we all reach the maximum, uh, you know, the, 11 degrees of deflection. And as you see, then the energy consumption didn't change much. So this is the maximum. And to me, uh, maybe I tell you this, uh, I think we started at 10 a.m. in the morning and it took like 12 hours to train this robot because it is so, you know, uh, to make the 120 rollouts, uh, 30 or like 80 rollouts using a human robot is very time consuming because every time the robot walks at least 10, 12 steps, then you start over then you start over and then you start over. So that's one of the bottlenecks of the reinforcement learning algorithm. Um, so here are the conclusion basically. So this is uh, evolving policy parameterization introduced in this work may handle the high dimensions problem at the beginning phase. And this is the first energy efficient walking of a real humanoid. I'm not talking about simulation, but real humanoid. Like, and the passive compliance alone is not sufficient for high energy efficiency because this robot was too soft already. To me, the springs were too soft, but yet, a, what we received is just 18% of reduction. So if you want to make more energy reduction then you can make softer, but then your controller bandwidth decreases. So you cannot really control this robot. So there is a trade-off between them. And I'm not sure if the series elasticity is the best uh, option for that. So that is the end of my talk. If you have any questions, either in Turkish or in English, uh, feel free to ask. Thank you for your attention. Biraz zaman fazla almışım ama arkadaşlar hala var. E, sorunuz varsa alabilirim. Birazcık hızlı konuşmak zorunda kalsın ama. Yani robot hakkında olabilir. İlla RL olmak hakkında son değil. Chat'ten görüyorum. What do you think about the developing the skeleton in the future? Yani şöyle, I can explain in Turkish because, you know, only foreigners are my four students, I think. Şimdi egzoskeleton özelinde, özellikle son dönemde bazı yatırımcı firmalarla da görüşüyoruz. Egzoskeletonları gördüyseniz eğer hep böyle bastonla yürüyorlar. Biz de bastonla yürümemesini istiyoruz açıkçası. Çünkü bastonla yürümenin çok fazla problemler oluyor. Özellikle bu kendi kendini dengelemesi, bu konuda Jesse hocamız var. Yani Atalante dışı skelet robotunun nasıl yürüdüğüyle hakkında bugün konuşacaktır diye tahmin ediyorum. Ee, o önemli bir mesele ve ama diyeceksiniz ki yani humanoid robotlar yıllardır kendi başına yürüyor da egzozlar niye olmuyor? Humanoid robotun içine insan girmiyor ya. Dolayısıyla motorları istediğiniz gibi yataklayabilirsiniz. Egzoskeletin içine insan girdiği için öyle kafamıza göre bacağına motor yataklayamıyoruz. Ağırlığı artıyor. Ağırlığı artınca bu sefer çok bal gibi böyle kocaman şeyler çıkıyor. Bu Cihan Çimen'in sorusu. Dolayısıyla da e, daha zor bir de içi boş olduğu için farklı şeyleri var. Yani ben bir humanoid robot olunca yani içini zaten mekanik olarak motor, dişliği de falan oluyor. Daha böyle bir hollow yapısı oluyor egzoskeletonun dengelemesi daha zor açıkçası. 
E, o yüzden e, kendi kendini dengelemesi için zaten bir kere en az 6 eksen koymanız gerekiyor. Egzoskeratonları bunu koyamıyorlar. Baston yürümesinin sebebi de o. Bu motorları e, yataklamak, fazla motor koymak hem ağırlık açısından hem de mekanik dizayn açısından zorlu problemler. E, aynı zamanda dinamiği de çok daha farklı. Bir de bunun dışında hadi hepsini yaptınız. İçeride de böyle bir tane kinematik bir zincir daha var. Robot var. Robotu siz imal ettiniz. Her şeyini biliyorsunuz. Bir de insan var. Yani ben giydim bugün. Başka gün başka birisi giydiği zaman e, parametre belirsizliği var. Onların ışığında kontrol yapmak daha zorlu. Bu parametre belirsizliği belki bir motorda olsa olur da her linkte var. Ataleti değişen ve bu e, iki tane kinematik zincirin de birine bağlantı noktaları var. O yüzden egzoskeletonların yani Bayağı bir henüz şu anda açık konular var yani kısacası. Başka soru var mı? Göremedim. Hanım? Ee, hocam çok teşekkür ederiz. Tamam. Ee, yine yazmak isteyen varsa bu arada yazabilir. Yazabilirler. Ee, ben şimdi... E, evet teşekkür ederim çok sağ olun. Ee, hocam Bak, öncelikle yani bu oturumu e, organize ettiğiniz için çok teşekkür ederim. Tamam. Şimdi Sonra değerli sunumumuz için çok teşekkür ederim. Dersin nedeniyle çıkmak zorunda kalacağım. Size başarılı çalıştaylar diliyorum. Teşekkür ederim. Tamam. Teşekkür ederim hocam. Görüşmek üzere. I would like to invite Sarah Hamdan. It's presentation. Uh, his, um, sorry. Uh, her presentation title is Human to Robot Skill Transfer for Robot Aided Polishing Task. Sarah, can yes, you hear me? I am here. Yeah. Hello. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Start. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for like uh, introducing me. First of all, I'll, I will share my screen to present the presentation. That yeah. This one. Okay. Please, can you acknowledge that you see the presentation? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, today I will speak about human to robot skill transfer for robot added polishing task. Uh, it is like a project that we did it in biomechatronics lab, and it is like part of this workshop and session uh, talking about artificial intelligence and AI research in the lab. Uh, starting with the, the concept human to robot skill transfer. Uh, actually, like the common understanding between people that we need, like the robot will take the jobs of the human, but it is not correct. Actually, we need some kind of collaboration between the human and the robot to do like the task that we want. Uh, in this project, or normally in this concept, we need to uh, apply it. If you want to apply it in industrial, we need to, the worker to manipulate the robot like a tool. So he, he or she will hold the robot, do some task uh, in the training phase, and then the robot will learn this task and can autonomously handle this task again and again in the testing phase. Uh, then the workers can focus on more complicated tasks or even like it can control what's going on with the robot also. And Actually, I will start with the video of the project just to give you more like idea. What did we do? Then I will explain the details of how did we do this project. Uh, we implement a robot or a human to robot skill transfer using this task, the polishing task. But of course, it can be a general like applied to like many other tasks, industrial tasks. Uh, in the first step, we have the training step where the robot will start, will move to the default position. And then the worker, which is me in this case, will hold the robot. You can see that uh, it holds the robot, it holds the robot and do the task as like holding any tool, like doing abolishing without the robot, just forget about the robot. And like you can focus on only the abolisher. So you will, uh, make the robot do some trajectory on this metal surface. And then uh, the robot will learn this task and uh, do the testing phase. Between training phase and testing phase, of course, there is a lot of learning uh, in order to make the robot learn. So we build a neural network for that. I will explain it in details, but I will show you the testing phase. 
here we only will run the robot, we will run actually the abolisher and start the task. The robot will do the task, the same trajectory that we train on it, but in a, like a good way, I mean without um, shaking or like it will do the abolishing correctly as the worker train it on. So in this case, uh, actually you may ask, is it like repeating just we train on trajectory and then the robot will repeat it uh, the same? Actually, you know, this is the uh, like the job of learning. In this case, we implement some uh, learning algorithm so using a neural network in order to make the robot learn the, the trajectory, not only repeat it again and again. Because uh, we, of course, there is, you know, there is some admittance control parameters. There is some parameters from the, like when it touch the surface. So you need to uh, learn those all parameters in order to do the task efficiently. Uh, speaking about what are the hardwares that we used in this project, we used a UR5 robot. It is a six degree of freedom robot. We, we add to it an optoforce sensor because in this uh, robot, we don't have a force sensor in each joint. So we need to add this optoforce sensor. And also we added a polisher uh, to the end effector of the robot. According to that, we have the full hardware for our project. And we have this metal surface. About the robot, uh, quickly, it is like a six degree of freedom robot. It has a payload of five kilograms. So that's why it's called UR5. And it has like more, uh, like all joints, for example, uh, the joint range, the radius, you can like check more about them. Uh, this robot can be controlled uh, using two ways. The first way is using teach pendant, and it is actually a simple, a very simple way of controlling it. It's just, you can see here from the screen that you have all the joints, you can move them, to, uh, this arrow to the left or to the right to, in order to, um, like control the robot, or you can use a low level control, which you will write a script in workstation and you will connect this workstation or your PC to the control unit of the robot using the USB uh, board. And this is the control unit, which has all the soft uh, safety control and the motherboard and all the power uh, control or the power unit. Uh, about the robot, we started, of course, uh, as you know, about the, the ro like to know what is the, uh, or to build the forward kinematic of the robot to build all those transformation matrices. So uh, we have uh, uh, six transformation matrices, and then we have the one that will uh, transfer the movement from the base joint to the end effector joint, which is the final, uh, we call it A6, the final one. Uh, and then we have the optoforce, which is we add it to the robot. Uh, it will read for us the force and the torque values. And it has a six axis, uh, three for force and three for torque. And it can like read X, Y, and Z for uh, Cartesian axis. And it can read also the rotational axis, uh, roll pitch and the out. Uh, we add here, because we add the force sensor, we need to, we uh, like after like some test or some study on the robot, we found that the frame of the end effector is different from the frame of the sensor. So we need to add more like matrix, matrix one matrix A7 in order to find the correct uh, transformation uh, or correct transformation matrix and correct forward kinematic. Then uh, because we added the force sensor, we need uh, to make a simple neural network in order to be able to communicate with the robot and the sensor uh, at the same time. So we add a simple new network. Uh, we have a switch and we have the Ethernet cab cables between we connect the robot, the force sensor, and the BC that we have the script of controlling. Then we added the polisher, which is very like simple, not, uh, I mean, we didn't control or anything like the polisher, just to run the polishing task. And then in order to uh, work on the software part of the project, we used Linux, we used Ubuntu and ROS, Robotic Operating System, uh, Kinetic, we used this uh, version and we used Python controlling language. Uh, 
about ROS, it is uh, called ROS robot operating system, but actually it is not an operating system. It, it is like uh, uh, providing a services for the operating system. That's why we like uh, download it on Linux, which is the main operating system. And this uh, ROS, it will provide us with some libraries and tool to uh, communicate with the robots with like a lot of uh, different types of the robots. Of robots, I mean. Uh, the ROS works in the concept uh, on the concept of nodes. Uh, it has a master node. We should actually, when we want to deal with ROS, we should create this master node, and we can create as many as we want, uh, silver uh, or uh, slave nodes. Uh, we can create like uh, uh, any number of nodes and there is those messages in communicating between nodes and each node, we when we create each node, it should register with the master node to be able to communicate between them. For our project, we have four nodes. We have one main node or the master node and we have three uh, uh, nodes like we, that we created. One for the force sensor, which we can read uh, the uh, values from the force and torque, and one for the encoder, which will read the position and uh, velocity from the encoder of the robot. And one, we call it test move, or we can call it any like name, any other name. Uh, this one, it will be the main code that we will run uh, on the robot. And it, it contains also the trajectory that we want the robot to implement. And there is some messages between the nodes uh, to uh, like control uh, the, uh, I mean the whole project to implement the whole project. Uh, in ROS, we are dealing with three main commands. We have the ROS core, which will start ROS. We have ROS launch. In this case, we launch this UR modern driver, which is the driver of the robot. And then we have ROS run, which will run any type of uh, code that we want to implement uh, on the robot. Of course, you should also give the IP of the robot in, of, like in our uh, network. And another thing we need also to run this force node. It, again, we will have ROS launch in order to launch the driver of the, this uh, force sensor. And then we have a run in order to run any kind of like uh, script that we wrote to control or to read from this uh, force sensor. So the diagram of the project, we have, uh, as I said, the UR5 robot, we have the force sensor, we have the polisher, we have embedded encoder, which is encoder built in the robot in each joint. It can read the position and velocity of each uh, joint. Uh, we can give to the robot uh, velocity commands. Actually, here we test that we can give position commands or the velocity commands, but uh, in our case or after some testing, we found that the velocity commands are more like uh, accurate. So we uh, focus on it. And we can read the robot states. Uh, we define a state as a position and angular velocity of each joint. Also, we can read the force sensor, which will give us the force and moment of the joint, or of actually the end effector or the last uh, part. Now we need something called force profile. In this case, as I show in the video, uh, we are not, we don't want only to repeat this state as it is. We don't want to repeat like the position and the velocity as it is. I will show it later if we repeat it as it is what will happen. But in this idea, we added also the force values. So we need uh, some kind of force profile, uh, which is uh, its function is to give us what is the force value at each state, at each position and velocity. In order to find this force profile, we build a neural network, a deep neural network actually with many layers, hidden layers. And this neural network will be trained on this state and this, those force and moments in order to give us the predicted force and moments at each state when we uh, test the robots later. Uh, the design of this neural network, we found that uh, like for us, that was a good design uh, with two hidden layers, one input layer and one output layer. The input layer is 20 neurons six for the positions and six for the angular velocities. The output is also six, uh, which is the three for force and the three for moments. 
According to that, actually also we tuned these parameters, the number of uh, neurons in the hidden layer, the uh, like uh, uh, the activation. Yeah. For, yes. Uh, so sorry, uh, we have uh, a little time. Please, okay, yeah, uh, I will finish pass. soon. Yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. I will. And after that, uh, as a result of this neural network, we have the force reference. We have the force value was that we read from the sensor. Comparing both of them, we can find a force error. And then we can implement admittance control in order to give us the velocity that we will give it to the robot. The admittance control, as you know, is my spring dumbbell system. Uh, we created that system and then from this system, we can uh, have the angular velocity, we call it calc, which is the calculated one. We will give it back as a command to the robot. So that's how we closed all the loop. We add also spline here interpolation for the states, and also we use Jacobian to convert between spaces. According to that, this is the full loop of the project. Uh, and as you saw in the beginning, we trained the robot, and then we make a testing step. Uh, according to like all the things that we built. And then we plot what is the difference between the measured force and the force that we found from the predicted or the predicted force. We found that there is matching between them, kind of. There is some noise which needs a tuning for the parameters. Last thing, just if we give back all like the states uh, uh, like directly to the robot, it will call trajectory playback. And in this case, just quickly, I will show it. You can, for example, this is the testing part. When you run the robot without any force feedback or any force uh, values, you can see that the robot will try to move on that trajectory. But when it touch the surface, it couldn't complete again because it doesn't have this force feedback. So you can see from the blots that it will stop. And this is called force induced motion. So as a conclusion, we could extract the force profile. We could build this neural network in order to predict it. We roll in order to build this uh, project. As a future work, we will uh, tune those parameters of admittance control using RL because we tune it manually. And uh, it, is, uh, it is funded by AU, this project. And thanks, Archili, for providing the hardware setup. Thank you for listening. Uh, OK. Thank you. Thank you for your valuable presentation, Sarah. Thank you. Do you have a question in Turkish or in, in English? Sarah, thank you. Uh, I will give uh, your certificate. Uh, okay, thank you. Sarah. Just a moment. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. See you. Uh, I will invite uh, the other uh, next speaker, Ahmed Soliman. Hello. Hello. His presentation title is 3D Walking Planning and Control for Self Balancing Lower Body Exoskeleton. Okay. So can I start now? Yes, please. OK, thank you so much. Thanks for the introduction. I am Ahmed Soliman. I am a PhD student in Ozin University in Biomechatronics Laboratory. And I'm going to speak today our, about our controller for controlling a self-balanced lower body exoskeleton for, for exhibiting 3D walking motion. So uh, this is briefly my agenda. We'll first speak about the introduction, then kinematic solution, and then uh, uh, br briefly about the dynamic controllers, and eventually we'll speak about our results and simulation. So initially, lower body exoskeleton, the most most uh, most of the lower body exoskeleton relies on uh, the usage of crutches, which uh, requires uh, engagement from the upper body of the user. Uh, in order to maintain the balance of the walking motion. Uh, actually, this is going to limit, or this is limiting the gait capability, firstly, and second, this requires uh, continuous upper body engagement. In order to, uh, to get rid of these uh, crutches, 
So basically, we have to get uh, to increase the number of actuators per uh, leg for uh, lower body exos. So um, mostly these exos are activated by uh, hip flexors and knee flexors. Actually, in our own knowledge, we know that the first uh, exos, self-balanced exoskeleton was exor, which is developed in ATR in Japan. It was, actu it was um, actuated for, um, for uh, hip, uh, knee, and uh, ankle, uh, ankle uh, flexors. Uh, also, there is a uh, mind walker exoskeleton, uh, which is actuated uh, with three actuators per leg for hip, uh, for hip flexors, knee flexors, and hip abductors, in addition to uh, two passive joints. Actually, uh, none of these exoskeletons show a self-balanced walking motion. Uh, exor in Japan was for uh, for train for uh, sitting down and standing up uh, trainings. Uh, for mind walker, they didn't show uh, uh, dynamic walk, balanced dynamic walking motion uh, experimentally. So uh, right now we are developing coex exoskeleton in our uh, Ozin laboratory. This coex exoskeleton is uh, is equipped by hip abductors and uh, as shown in the video and hip flexors and knee flexors and ankle flexors so for activated joints per leg which means that uh, an under activation problem uh, moreover for for the shown exoskeleton is having an extra problem due to its high inertia so an under activation problem and uh, and also an uh, a high inertia which requires uh, uh, a robust controller to develop the walking motion. So uh, basically our uh, framework is generally consists of a Cartesian trajectory generator. This Cartesian trajectory generator is based on zero moment point based for generating center of mass trajectory and a set of polynomial trajectories to generate uh, the Cartesian displacement of the uh, robot feet. These Cartesian trajectories are passed to optimize the inverse kinematics to generate or to map these Cartesian trajectories to joint trajectories. Uh, this uh, optimized inverse kinematics is equipped due to the under activation of the robot leg because uh, generally we, we need six, six actuators per leg to generate the walking motion. But right now we are just having four actuators per leg and we cannot increase the number of actuation due to uh, energy uh, constraints. And we verified, uh, eventually we verified these joint trajectories using some realistic robot model which built in MSC Adams environment. And we use this realistic robot model as a simulator for us uh, to acquire the contact uh, forces and the actual center of mass position. And we pass these actual signals uh, back again through feedback locomotion controller, which adds some correction signals to the optimized inverse kinematics. So the optimized inverse kinematics, generally speaking, we are speaking about a locomotion, locomotion which is having two, two legs, left foot uh, or two feet, two uh, left foot and right foot, in addition to the body, torso and center of gravity, so, which means that we are having three end effectors with three Jacobian matrices. These three Jacobian matrices can be stacked in one Jacobian matrices as shown. These Jacobian matrices can be minimized using using this simple quadratic uh, equation. And, to, uh, uh, and as a reason, due to under activation, we cannot reach the whole uh, desired trajectories because right now we need to, we need to achieve uh, six, uh, six trajectories for the swinging leg and six trajectories for the center of mass and the torso uh, orientation. So what we did actually, we divided this set of trajectories into two sets. The first set, which is a period set, consists contains center of mass uh, trajectories, which is based on Z, ZMP. In addition to swinging swinging foot, in addition to swinging foot translation, in addition to the constraints. In the second set, we consider the center of mass elevation, which is the height, in addition to torso and the swinging foot orientation. And we project the second second uh, prioritization level solution to the first prioritization level 
through the null space matrix using some pseudo inversions. So this is simply was our optimization problem. And in order to involve some dynamic uh, controller, we started by uh, solving the robot dynamic model. Basically, this is a general dynamic model. In order to compute the inertia matrix, we used an algorithm called composite rigid body algorithm. Its computation time was fitted with real time applications, which is about uh, 0.009 milliseconds. Also to compute the centrifugal gravitational uh, Coriolis matrix, we used Newton Euler algorithm, which is its computation time was in range of 0.07 milliseconds. And this was the Jacobian constraints, which which requires to link the constraint force to the floating base and other joint variables. And its computation time was 0.1 millisecond, which is computed using a recursive uh, algorithm. And after computing this dynamic model, we were we were able to use a kind of a centroidal momentum, a kind of controller such as centroidal momentum controller. This centroidal momentum controller is based on computing what's called centroidal momentum matrix AG. The idea of this centroidal momentum controller is to project the whole momentum around the robot on its center of mass. This allows engagement of torso orientation and the, the arm and the robot arms. Hello? Hello? Is somebody... My... Can you hear me, please? Hello? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Continue, please. Mm -hmm. Continue. Okay, thank you. So actually, this centroidal momentum controller algorithm allows the upper body, such as torso and arms, to engage with the, with the, with the walking, with the lower body uh, over the walking motion through a kind of coordination as shown in this video. So this, this uh, centroidal momentum controller can be exploited through centroidal momentum matrix, which, is, which can be used to map the joint variables to the uh, orientation or the angular and linear momentum. In the second control technique, we use what's called admittance controller. In this admittance controller, we consider a virtual spring damper model beneath the robot feet. We uh, use this uh, model uh, as a kind of uh, cushion, which can act like a shock absorber, which can absorb uh, shocks during uh, contact instance, uh, uh, during walking motion through robot feet. Uh, basically, we use the actual forces, which is acquired from the robot model, and the referential forces, which is designed based on zero moment point trajectory generator. And we use the difference between them, and the difference between them is considered as an error signal, which is injected to the spring to a spring damper model. So this is basically how the referential force is computed. So basically, we are having this desired acceleration from ZMP uh, center of mass uh, trajectory generator, and this is the momentum and how it, how does it compute it? And we can use these referential forces with uh, augmented with the force distribution functions shown here in this plot in order to distribute this uh, referential forces over the two uh, feet. And eventually we come up with two general frameworks or two uh, specific frameworks for each uh, controller. The first framework is based on the admittance controller which acquires the actual forces from the, uh, from the uh, realistic model, based, uh, built, which is built in MSC Adams. And it acquires the desired acceleration from the Cartesian trajectory generator and generates an, a correction signal. This correction signal is in the form of velocities, which is passed to the optimization algorithm. And this optimization algorithm uh, acquires these uh, signals. And we added also a ZMP PD controller, which improved this controller to the optimization and this optimization algorithm with uh, respect to the referential uh, veloc referential Cartesian trajectories and the correction signals allows all these signals augmented together to be passed to the dynamic model and the uh, Adams model. On the second side, we used, uh, uh, we used somehow near uh, framework, but rather than using admittance controller, we used momentum 
uh, we used a centroidal momentum control. This momentum centroidal control used the momentum references in order uh, which is extracted from the Cartesian trajectories and passed to optimization inverse algorithm. And also it uses centroidal momentum matrix, which is extracted from the dynamic model. And the MPPD control as a kind of improvement for this controller. And all of them are passed to inverse, kin inverse kinematics algorithm and then uh, propagated to the, to the robot models through uh, joint trajectories obtained from this inverse kinematics algorithm. In order to verify these two frameworks, we built, as we said before, a dynamic model in MSC Adams environment. And in order to obtain some realistic uh, data, we uh, obtained the, the, the inertia parameters for the exoskeleton from a, from a pre-designed CAD model. Uh, and the biomechanical uh, iner uh, inertia parameters are obtained from uh, based on uh, two, refer two references. And we used all these uh, dynamic parameters to build our dynamic model in Adam's environment. And eventually, this is the sim our simulation results. So initially, this uh, this was the application of centroidal momentum controller with the improved ZMP controller, in uh, which shows the robot motion in the colored uh, model, while the open loop controller, which is showed in green model, for 0.35 uh, meter per second forward velocity, which verifies our control methodology. In second simulation, we are comparing centroidal momentum controller and the MPPD controller uh, versus uh, centro just centroidal momentum controller under the effect of uh, different disturbances. And actually, uh, centroidal momentum controller only show us, shows a slight deviation from the uh, required uh, trajectory or from the referential trajectory. And in the last simulation video, we showed a comparison between a centroidal momentum controller with the MPPD controller in colored model and, as in, and admittance controller uh, with the MPPD controller in green model under the effect of uh, different disturbances also, which shows a uh, deviation from the required, referenti required referential trajectory. And this was our uh, results in this research. Uh, actually, this shows uh, admittance controller and admittance with ZMP. Admittance with ZMP in blue lines, while the admittance controller just in red line, which shows an improved ZMP trajectories here with respect to simulation and the full supporting polygon boundaries, which is represented in solid black line. While this shows the center of mass trajectory, or sorry, center of mass responses, for the green line and black line, which is admittance and admittance with improved ZMP, and the blue and red line, which is centroidal momentum control and centroidal momentum with improved with ZMP PD controller. And uh, from this graph, we concluded that centroidal momentum control was acting uh, betterly uh, in case of uh, free walking motion without disturbances. And centroidal momentum controller and centroidal momentum controller with ZMP uh, controller are acting almost the same. And this is the ZMP response for centroidal momentum control controller in red and centroidal momentum controller with improved ZMP. And actually, uh, ZMP, uh, ZMP controller addition showed an improved uh, ZMP response in terms of oscillations. And this was the responses under the effect of uh, disturbances. Uh, and as we can see from the Cartesian responses that the centroidal momentum controller with ZMP damper or with ZMP PD controller acts, uh, acts better than the other, uh, the other applied controllers in terms of Cartesian uh, responses. And in terms of ZMP uh, response, uh, actually the admittance controller with ZMP controller acts uh, with less oscillatory and uh, slightly pushed away from the uh, supporting polygon bound boundaries. And the same for centroidal momentum controller with ZMP damper. And this was, uh, this was uh, the case, uh, or this was the result for simulation experiment. 
and actually recently we started uh, we started doing uh, some, some experimental work with the recently manufactured exoskeleton in our uh, biomechatronics laboratory in Ozin. Uh, this was simple uh, squatting uh, experiment in which the robot uh, squats forward and backward. It transfers from backward to forward in three seconds and stays for about two seconds and then returns back through three seconds and so on. It developed, we developed this uh, cyclic motion for, uh, for about uh, a minute, which verifies the joint trajectories. The joint trajectory uh, tracking for uh, joint trajectory tracking, uh, and it was an initial experiment in order to do an extra work uh, through applying different uh, locomotion controller. Uh, this was my presentation, and thank you for listening. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ahmed. Uh, do you have a question? Okay. Okay. Thank you again. I will present your uh, presentation certificate. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. I'm closing the session. Uh, see you to the next session. Uh, see you. I'm closing. Okay, see you.